This video is brought to you by the 3 Minute Board Game Patrons. Keep us independent by supporting us on Patreon. Kia ora koutou and welcome to the very first of what will hopefully be a long series of 3 Minute Board Games reviewing the Arkham Horror Campaigns. Our plan is, once we finish a campaign for the first time, we do a wrap up video like this. Now we have played through the Dunwich Horror as well, but I'll leave recapping that until we play it through again which might be for a while because there's a heck of a lot of campaigns that we haven't got to yet. In fact, we haven't got to every campaign aside from Night of the Zealot, the Dunwich Horror, and now, the Path to Carcosa. I'll tell you about the Yellow King. Now, the reason we're covering the Path to Carcosa is I asked people, what campaign should we do next? The Path to Carcosa was head and shoulders ahead of everyone else. And I was pretty happy by that because it was the one I was probably most excited to try myself. You see, I've read all of Lovecraft's works, but I haven't read The King in Yellow. Um, mostly because it's written by a different person. It's actually not an H.P. Lovecraft piece. Uh, it's written by a Robert Chambers. And although it's been incorporated into the Lovecraftian world, the Cthulhu Mythos, um, yeah, it's not one that I'd actually sat down and read. I have, however, played through uh, Tatters of the King which is a very, very big, popular, and well-loved Call of Cthulhu campaign. And it took us the better part of two years to get through. Uh, my character in that campaign was an alienist who was also a Pulp Fiction writer. Uh, so these are the covers that my character made for the adaptations and dramatizations of our stories as we went through the Tatters of the King. And, you know, spending two years in a very, very immersive uh, Call of Cthulhu campaign around Haster, I've, I've always wanted to play that particular campaign in Arkham Horror. I was curious to see how they would take the same inspiration and do it a little differently. And there were so many little points where we were crossing over in narratives, like the opening scene of The Tatters of the King is virtually identical to the opening scene of um, The Path to Carcosa. They're literally the same event. And the finales uh, share a lot of narrative in common as well. So there's definitely core stories, core motifs, uh, and core imagery that is very strong uh, throughout both The Tatters of the King and The Path to Carcosa. So, very big part of why I wanted to play this campaign. Oh, yeah. oh. And now onto a brief, but spoiler free, review of The Path to Carcosa campaign. This is of course caveated with our experience that we've played Night of the Zealot and The Dunwich Horror a bunch of times. So this is very much a review from a blind run perspective. So that is the perspective of someone who's played the campaign once and only once. So this was after our one complete run through. And we did get to the final mission and we did get a resolution in the final mission. We did not, however, win the final mission. And I'll talk much more about that in the spoiler section at the end of the video. But my overall first impressions of the Path to Carcosa are it is a giant step up. Uh, from the Dunwich legacy. Not that Dunwich is bad. Um, I think there's a little bit of thought out there that Dunwich is an utterly awful campaign compared to the others these days. And I think the step up is there. It's noticeable. Uh, there's a few missions in Dunwich that are kind of a bit wibbly and wobbly. Uh, and there's at least one that's kind of pointless. Um, and one that's potentially quite broken. And I thought overall the balance and fairness in Path to Carcosa seemed, uh, seemed a lot more there. I don't think at any time we felt completely and utterly dominated by the campaign, aside from in the finale, uh, which did end up kicking our ass quite, quite severely. But anyway, overall, of the eight missions, I would say there was one mission that's kind of okay-ish, uh, and it comes reasonably early on in the piece. Uh, there's two good missions, and the other five missions are just really, really excellent. Um, in particular, like... From about the midpoint on to the finale, there is just this run of absolute pure gold missions where each time we turned up, we'd read um, the acts and agendas and how the game was set up and we'd see how it was subverting our expectations. And that was a really cool thing about this campaign. There's nothing wrong with playing an Arkham game where it is get clues, beat bad guys. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. But Path of Carcosa constantly turns that idea on its head. Um, it messes about with doom, it messes about with agendas, it does a whole bunch of wacky stuff. Uh, I mean, when you set up a scenario for the first time and you look at it, you go, oh, okay, that's that's going to be interesting to play through. And that sense of discovery was, was real in this campaign. And the other two people playing it with me also felt that. They were like, yeah, this is, this is cool. This is turning out a little bit different. This isn't 
you know, just doing the same thing over and over. Each of these missions feels like it's exploring a different game space and telling a different story, which is really neat. Uh, the writing is excellent and there's some interesting bits in there uh, that make you feel like the game has an unreliable narrator or that your point of view is unreliable. It throws sentences and phrases at you that make you go, huh? What? Wait, I just said that out loud. Did I, did I mean to say that out loud? It plays with perspectives and it plays with sort of some of the conceits in having a narrative game. Um, and I think it's really, really cool. Like, I can't say much more without giving away big spoilers, but there are times when you'll be questioning what your characters are really doing. And um, that's neat. Uh, that there's some doubt that you're actually playing the game you think you're playing. Um, which I thought was was really cool and, and gave me a big smile when I got to those, those sections. Um, and there's this cool mechanic in the game as well called uh, conviction and doubt. Depending on decisions you make, uh, through the course of the campaign you'll build up a conviction or a doubt score or you'll have both uh, conviction and doubt and these impact on later missions uh, so your your decisions in earlier games uh, really do change uh, how the scenarios are structured towards the end and I, I do like that I, th I think there's something to be said about having a campaign that's not just narratively linked um, because that is fine having uh, eight disjointed scenarios that are linked by a consistent narrative I'm perfectly fine with that but I also really like the idea of the scenarios being linked mechanically as well so the narrative links them all up but there's also mechanics that thread their way through uh, the entire campaign and I found the conviction versus doubt thing was really neat and I want to do another run through of uh, the path to Carcosa choosing very different things than we chose the first time because I want to see just how differently the campaign turns out so a little bit of metagaming there, um, but I think that'd be quite fun just to see how different it makes, especially the finale, um, and how different it makes other scenarios. Uh, there's one there's one in particular that I think will make a really, really big difference. So in the version we played, we had to sort of run away from someone, uh, and I think if you play it the other way, you might want to chase them. Um, you know, without giving much more away than that, I think that would make that scenario in particular totally and utterly different. So how much would I recommend The Path to Carcosa? Well, I want to play it again. I kind of want to play it again right now. Uh, we are going to move on to a different campaign instead um, because we're kind of, you know, chasing content. Um, but I really want to try Path to Carcosa again. I really want to do it uh, with a different approach. And there's a lot of lessons we learned on the first time through that will probably help us in that, in particular, the final scenario where we got our asses absolutely handed to us. So the next bit we're gonna do is the lessons learned. So shortly after filming the following segment, I popped back inside and saw that my favorite Arkham the Card Game channel, playing board games, had done a video very recently that covers much the same ground. And I really recommend checking out playing board games for more Arkham the Card Game content, in particular, their spoiler-free guide to Carcosa right here. You can find more of that on their channel. Okay, we were going back to Carcosa. Here are some things that we would do a little differently, I think. And the first one is dealing with horror and horror damage. Uh, there is so much horror in this campaign. Uh, ridiculous amounts of horror. Ideally, you need to either have very high will scores, um, cards that allow you to boost will scores for, for tests, uh, high will to start with, uh, high sanity to start with, and ways to recover it or soak it. Um, because you'll get way more um, sanity and will damage than you could possibly think. You, you're thinking, oh, no, I've got some tools and mechanisms around that. You, you don't. You, you do not have enough. Um, going into this and it really proves uh, especially towards the end of the campaign uh, to be a very decisive factor in why we did not win uh, we did not win because our brains were not strong enough and we couldn't recover enough brain meat sanity um, to deal with the horrors that Carcosa contained the second thing we learned is that we needed to deal better with big monsters um, so our so our Guardian and Rogue were really good at crowd control. Uh, there are a couple of scenarios where you get swarmed by lots and lots of baddies, and they were really good at dealing with that. Um, Safina in particular used Storm of Swords to blow up groups of people, and then 
Mark Harrigan had uh, survival knives and he was pulling people over and just, you know, stabbing them in the face until they stopped moving. Really, really good when there are lots and lots of enemies. Where we kind of fell down a little was dealing with the big ones. Um, we didn't necessarily have anyone that was particularly great at evading. Uh, Safina could, but was not necessarily tooled out to do that as well as she could. Um, which is, you know, there's only so much uh, your flex can do, um, but perhaps we needed to have a bit more emphasis on um, evading there. And, uh, or we just needed the brute damage of someone with 10 fists and a shotgun to be able to just go Bram! and blow them to Kingdom Smeg. Um, because in the end, that's ultimately um, what cost us the finale is that we got swarmed by big, big critters. We couldn't deal with the big bad and the horror was kicking our ass at the same time. So those are two big things, but I think there's a third one as well. And the third one is we were too damn slow. And I don't mean that in terms of momentum or keeping the game's tempo up. We always felt quite good on that, but we didn't have a lot of cards that allowed us to move around uh, the maps particularly quickly. Um, and I, in particular, uh, my Seeker, uh, Min, just wasn't, I didn't take anything to really move around aside from a pair of hiking boots. And that's a very, very, very situational thing. Um, and there were times where, you know, you'd chase a baddie one way and then it'd take your whole turn to get back to where you needed to be. And the monsters at some points were spawning and chasing people and they were kind of moving a little bit faster um, than our characters could to, to deal with them. At various times, uh, I wish that we could just move a lot quicker and redeploy a lot quicker. Uh, Safina was the only one of us that could do this. Um, she had a bunch of cards that allowed her to move around, but myself as the main clue getter and Mark as the main uh, beat stick, we, we were pretty slow. And that, that really left us exposed a couple of times. So I think those are, those are probably the three big lessons um, we learned from going into uh, Carcosa for our first blind playthrough. That is, brain, brain will good. You can never have enough horror protection. You can never have enough horror soak. You can never have, have enough horror healing. Uh, big monsters are bad and will eat your face. So you really need something to deal with them and being able to move around and react better. Um, I think if we go back in, uh, if we deal with those three things, we'll have a much better run on our second run through. So I'm just going to have a quick talk through the deck I used. And I used a character in this game called Minty Fan, And my primary role in the group was to be the person who got the most clues. Uh, Min has pretty good stats. She's got four will and four book. That means she's pretty good at resisting horror and pretty good at getting clues. And her two fight and two feet means she's rubbish at fighting and getting away from monsters. Her special ability is once per round per investigator. Uh, if someone adds a skill card into a test, they get an extra uh, wildcard symbol on it. So essentially a boost of plus one to the skill test. Uh, that's a really cool thing. And you can build a Min deck around that. And I did have quite a few skill cards in my deck but that wasn't the focal point. Uh, the reason I picked Min is because of her deck building restrictions, which are zero to five level seeker cards, but zero to two survivor cards. Now I tend to build decks around what I call a cornerstone card. I'll come up with a card that I think is gonna be the key to the deck and how the deck operates. And for this particular deck, it was Shed a Light. And Shed a Light is a survivor card, which is why it works with Min quite well. Now, the core idea behind Shed a Light is you want to reduce Shroud to zero. Because once you've reduced Shroud to zero, you get three clues from this. Two from the location you're in, plus another one from a much harder to get location. So in order to pull this effect off, I needed a bunch of support cards. The first of those was the improved flashlight. This one has four charges, goes in your hand, and um, reduces the Shroud by two. A lot of locations only have two Shrouds, so that's enough to get you past the simple basic locations. But in order to get most locations, you need another effect as well. And for that, I had Arcane Insight, another card that reduces the location shroud by two. And one of the great things about having Flashlight and Arcane Insight is when you have relatively low shroud locations, you don't need to commit a skill card to them. Uh, you just reduce them down to a level where your stat plus skill is enough that you can get through most tests. And I could pick up a lot of clues. 
Also to reduce shroud and to get extra clues, I picked up Winging It, uh, which is a card that when you first play it, just reduces shroud by one, but then you can play it out of your discard pile and it reduces shroud by one and gets you an extra clue. And to get multiple uses of my Shed Light, I also put in two Resourcefuls. Those were entirely to get back that one particular card. Uh, scavenging was in the deck just to get back the flashlights and magnifying glass was in there to knock the empty flashlights out of my hand so uh, I could pick them up from the discard pile. The skills I picked up as well were all pretty straightforward. Uh, deduction for more clues, perception for the card draw and to deal with Min's terrible disadvantage, and gumption which is an amazing skill card that reduces the difficulty of a challenge by two. Which of course works around the succeed at zero archetype I was kind of playing around with. Rounding the deck off is Dr. Milan Christopher, who seems like an almost auto-include uh, in a Seeker deck because he gives you because he gives you plus one lore, which you use for looking for clues, and he gives you a resource when you investigate. Then there's also Earthly Serenity, which I use to recover primarily sanity. And finally, I've got a plan, which was a great panic button on the occasions that Min was left in a situation where she had to fight her way out of Monster, because almost invariably, Min had clues on her. Overall, this deck was very, very strong. Um, I got a lot of clues and was capable of getting burst clues and picking clues up from wacky locations. It did require a fair bit of setup and I was kind of playing against the grain a little by not going full on on skill cards with Min uh, and only sort of being in a halfway house there of, you know, lots of assets plus a fair amount of skill cards. Um, and at times I probably could have been a better support to the rest of the team because the skill cards I had were almost entirely revolving around brain or a book. I didn't have much to boost um, anyone's evade checks or anything like that. So yeah, I probably could have done more as a team player, but as a specialist clue getter, uh, this, you know, succeed at zero min deck worked really well. And I never felt like, until the final scenario, that we were behind the eight ball. Um, and the main reason, um, this is a small spoiler, is because in the particular version of the finale we played, there is a segment of the game where you cannot gain clues. And during that period of time, there was virtually nothing I could do. I, Min couldn't fight. Um, she couldn't even fight using her card that could do damage with clues. Um, and it were like, I think, three turns in the end because we were so slow at responding to this uh, change in how the scenario was working that I did nothing. And yeah, great clue getter, not very good at anything else. So that was my experience playing a Min deck uh, that focused on gaining clues at difficulty zero. Well, that concludes the spoiler free or at least spoiler light section of the video. Uh, from here on in, there be spoilers ahoy, so please take note. All right, we're now heading into the really spoilery part of the review. And I'm gonna keep this brief, I'm just gonna bring up a couple of highlights from each scenario as we just blast through them. Okay, so Curtain Call. This is exactly how the Tatters of the King RPG game begins as well. Uh, you literally fall asleep at the end of the first act of a really, really, really bad rendition of the play and wake up and things have gone to absolute custard. In Tatters of the King, it's uh, done as a riot. Uh, in this one, everyone seems to have disappeared and, and it's it's kind of odd and, and a little different but still very much i felt like oh yeah I, i've i've been here before as for the scenario design it seemed okay like pretty cool arkham uh i think the one point of difference was the big bad at the end who if you who would respawn uh, and you would only get the victory points for him if he was off the board and i thought that was really neat uh, about arranging the timing so that we would finish scenario to get the victory points for that fat fuck. Um, and we did, we did get, we got him. Uh, and he only respawned, I think, the once. Uh, so that was pretty cool. So Curtain Call was a really good opening act, but then we got on to the second scenario. And I think The Last King is really, really good. Like, this is a really neat scenario. Uh, and we did terribly at it. I think we managed to interview two people uh, before things got really out of hand. Uh, Mark Harrigan, our, our fighter, got knocked out uh, in, this, in this scenario. And then we got to a point where Fraser and I, who Fraser was playing Serafina, mm -hmm. were sitting there going, we need to leave now. Uh, we need to take some, you know, attacks of opportunity and move to the exit. You know, take two attacks of opportunity each, moving to the exit to leave. 
or we're all we're all going to die right here um and that was that was really tense because the, the whole scenario just escalated instantly uh, like it felt like you were just having a a wee investigation and then the like, shit hits the fan and i'd be fascinated to see how differently this one plays um based on who flips over um and what uh, guess you get to interview and how much impact that has as the campaign goes through uh yeah the last king really really neat scenario um one of the favorite ones i've played uh to date in all of arkham then we get to scenario three echoes of the past and it's fine uh this is i think the weakest scenario in the whole uh campaign and this is a really good example of how al um safina and mark are really good at crowd control um, I just kind of sauntered around this place just hoovering up clues and they just kept putting stabby things in everyone as they turned up and it felt quite pedestrian. It might just be that we had the right uh, group to take this one off um, but I didn't really feel a sense of drama uh, and I also just thought it was a pretty average kind of get clues, things open up, get clues, go into the new area. Uh, sort of scenario um yeah not one that really grabbed me uh, maybe it's because we just had it under control the whole time so there wasn't a sense of tension but yeah my first impressions of the scenario is that it is probably the weakest one uh in in this this cycle uh this campaign um happy to hear your thoughts if i'm wrong about that but it just seemed kind of average which is not something one can say of scenario for the unspeakable oath this this was the point where i thought okay this camp i can see why this campaign is so popular i can see why people are like yeah this is carcosa is great because the last king was really good this might be better and there's this one particular part in this scenario that really makes me smile and it's when you're in the cells towards the end and you read a piece of dialogue and it's something like you try to remember the way out I'm like what, what do you mean remember the way out I, we've never been here before or have we and it's a great example of where the unreliable narrator that keeps popping up uh in um Path to carcosa really just kind of sets you on edge because you, you're reading the dialogue you're like wait a second this game is messing with me um and i really really appreciated that we did very well on this one as well but I could tell um, as we were going through that if we hadn't ticked off all these boxes by the time something happened, we were going to be in a world of hurt. And we were very fortunate um, that we'd been very thorough in ticking those boxes off um, so that when, when it goes to custard, we literally had to bolt to the end uh, and we've kind of already done all of the side quests that you need to escape. Um, so yeah, that was that was good on our part and this again our team is really good at crowd controlling uh small groups and in this scenario i think that was a that was a good choice um because you know there are a couple of um storm of swords or what the the mystic one that blows up a lot of people uh, i think that got painted worlds uh, painted worlded a few times uh so there are lots of stack them all together and blow them up kind of deals going on here but this this was a really cool scenario um top notch felt tense uh and getting out of it was a really big deal like you found at the end of it that you'd literally escape something really dire say my name say my name no one is around you say baby i love you you ain't one in game scenario five a phantom of truth now i've said that scenario two was the best scenario i played and i've said scenario four was the best scenario i've played but it's in fact i think a phantom of truth this is my favorite scenario uh from all of arkham that i have played to date uh, it was really scary. Uh, we played the version where the baddie is chasing us and it's unkillable, and we weren't necessarily that good at evade, and Fraser just took this guy out of it every turn. Somehow we managed to get the skill checks in uh, to stop this guy from like eating our face. And it was real tense. I'm like trying to get all the clues and, and, and sort it all out, and Mark's dealing with everything else, and Fraser is just focused on this, this one guy and wow what a what a cool scenario um and i felt it felt tense all the way up to the end and 
yeah, I couldn't ask for I couldn't ask for more from a scenario. I thought this was just really neat. Um, the locations were really cool as well, like uh, the, uh, being in France, um, and the idea that you had to survive three nights because you're like, ah, oh, after like scenario one takes over its uh, first night, you're like, oh, surely we can get some rest between nights. No, no rest. That's just that's just the next uh, agenda. And like, oh god. We've got to keep doing this. We've got to keep running away from this evil, unstoppable bastard. Um, yeah, Phantom of Truth. What a what a great time. Um, yeah, it's it's one I'd, I'd contemplate playing as a standalone. I uh, enjoyed it that much. So, and then um, yeah, really really dug it. Uh, scenario six was the Pallid Mask, and that was done inside the Catacombs of Paris, uh, which Fraser has actually been to and uh, told us just how damn creepy they are in person. Um, this was a pretty good scenario. I, I enjoyed the catacombs and the layout because it's a randomly generated sort of sort of map. We ended up doing a big loop, and he and Fraser ended up like at the other end of this this loop away from us. So we had to do a concerted effort to try to link it all up into a big O. But that just meant that when the big bad turned up, he had a shorter route to us, so we had to run around him. Um, so there was a lot of fun playing with space uh, in this scenario, um, and. Yeah, it was, it was a good one. Uh, not quite as memorable as the two immediately before it, uh, but still an absolute solid part of, of this campaign. So yeah, I'm not saying much about this one, which is interesting, because I remember being at the end of a scenario and re having really enjoyed it, but um, apparently in reflection, it didn't stand out quite as much as the previous ones. But still, from what I remember, very good scenario, um, and had a lot of tension, and had the fun map building part to it as well. So not quite as cool though as the next scenario number seven uh black stars rise this this really turned the game on the head for me because the quirk with this one is you don't know which way carcosa is and which way Hastur is and that's all randomly allocated so there's two agenda decks instead of having an act and an agenda deck which is very odd and you're trying to put um you've got to choose where the doom goes and you don't know what's the correct answer when you start playing so you know you're initially trying to hedge your bets or, or i don't know just hit and hope that you get the right choice um we hedged our bets we played this one very very safe right up until the point we were very certain uh, we knew which way hasta was and which way carcosa was in which case we just hammered hard on that um so i stockpiled a lot of clues um and was spending them one to, um, in, a, in blocks in order to advance the doom to a turn once we knew what was going on um so i thought we had this one quite quite well managed it was still a very tense scenario um and we were being chased by some pretty big monsters at, at different times but we f i felt like we had this one in hand i felt like we had like four or five turns even up our sleeve um and we arrived to Carcosa by going up. So we arrived in the final uh, scenario, uh, Dim Carcosa, at the top of the map and had to work our way down. And I think we made a bunch of mistakes straight off the, the bat. First of all, I was like, okay, m there's all these clues in the middle of the board. That um, seems like it's a big thing. So I, I moved there and I wasted a lot of actions getting down there. Um, then we had monsters spawn around us and it pulled our group apart a little. Uh, and then the stranger turned up in the middle and I couldn't fight him and it took a while for everyone to get back to me and then Hastur himself turned up and just proved to be a giant pain in the ass. I think in the end we put 14 damage on him um, which was definitely not enough uh, and the horror rules in this particular scenario are just, <laughs> they're, they're horrible, they're horrific. Um, because you go over your horror limit and that is like normally if you if you get a character who's got seven sanity you take seven sanity that's it you're gone and this yeah just keep going and i think seraphina at one point was on 17 sanity uh, damage um, and that was making these tests just awful every time the skull came out it was a minus four um and there's three in the in the pile um, and there were a bunch of cards that were just really unpleasant if you were over your sanity pile. And then there was other ones that were like, um, you know, Mark had to stab Seraphina at one point. 
um, because um, if he didn't get rid of that card, he was uh, going to, next time, um, if it stayed in his hand, he was probably going to die himself. So, yeah, um, the wheels really came off. And I've mentioned in the where we would improve uh, part of the video, what we need to do better here. Um, and I really want to see what's on the back side of a lot of those cards because I didn't look at them afterwards. Um, aside from the middle one, because I was like, okay. I bet you the, the thing that they said is going to be on the bottom of that one. So I was right thinking that the central card was important. Uh, I was wrong in thinking that I needed to go there and do that straight away. Um, yeah, and again, I think if we had more maneuverability and more ability to deal with massive monsters or just put out big burst damage, uh, the scenario wouldn't have eaten us alive. And it did. It absolutely, like, the first turn or so, we had multiple four health critters um, spawn. And from that point, we were on the back foot. Um, so yeah, the the finale was a bit of a bit of a downer, but you know that's 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 the thing with Arkham. If you're playing a campaign and you lose the finale, so what? Um, you know, it's all about getting to that final battle and then seeing how well you do. You can't win them all, uh, and we certainly did not win this one. Uh, I don't think we we really got particularly close, but I still want to do it again. I want to give it another go. So yeah, very very exciting. Um, and in conclusion, the Path to Carcosa is a fantastic um, campaign. Uh, the scenario design is really neat. There's so many times with the writing and how things are put together that I was just going, oh, that, that's, that's neat. Oh, I forgot to mention there's one of the scenarios where they play around with Doom differently. So Doom works in a totally different way than normal. And I was like, that is so clever. It's like just really clever design stuff um, that just made me go oh this is this is gonna be a different experience this is not gonna be just the same thing each time so yeah um that's my final thoughts on the path to carcosa what a phenomenal experience uh and a phenomenal campaign and really looking forward to the other campaigns for arkham horror <laughs>And that concludes our coverage of the Path to Carcosa. The next campaign we'll be trying is the Scarlet Keys, and I'm going to be trying a Carson Sinclair all support deck, which should be a bit silly. And if you enjoyed this video, hit the notification button, like, share, and subscribe to the channel, and support us on Patreon. <sighs> Cheers, everyone. Oh my god, that's disgusting. God! Ah! Ugh. <sighs>